Amen. The book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 36. This is at the end of a familiar story to many of us, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus said, So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, being the lawyer or the religious expert, he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. And therein is my subject this evening, go and do likewise. God bless you. you may be seated. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and onward, sometimes called the Shema of the Old Testament, was foundational to the God's people was foundational to their faith in the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. They inscribed this into the doorposts of their house. They inscribed it into the gates of their fences, and every Jewish male quoted it twice a day. It was foundational. But closely intertwined with this passage was Leviticus 19 and 18, where God told his people, You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So together, these two love commands fundamentally encapsulated God's expectations for his people. But instead of living out these commands as a light to the Gentiles as God had intended, the Jewish people misconstrued them and the correlating principles of separation and holiness that God had taught them and they adopted restrictive traditions that restrained those commands to only be applicable to fellow Jews or maybe resident proselytes. They justified attitudes of self-righteous superiority towards all others, and they saw separation as a barrier against, not a protection from. So although Jesus agreed with the centrality of these two commands. Although he was the author of these two commands, it should not surprise us that Jesus adamantly disagreed with their exclusionary practices. In fact, to say that Jesus' teaching and actions were unorthodox to their tradition would be a gross understatement. He associated with sinners he liked hanging out with social outcasts. He dared heal, heal people on the Sabbath. He obliterated boundaries between friends and enemies and even said, love your enemies. Much to their chagrin, Jesus continually demonstrated and taught that there were no allowable boundaries or barriers to loving others. And such is the case in Luke, where Jesus had an encounter with a religious expert or a lawyer in Luke 10 and verse 25 tells us that a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. That is courageous or foolish in my opinion, that you would stand up and seek to take on the word, the living word incarnate. But this guy did. And he said, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That's a heavy question. So the context of what follows is a question of eternity. It is a question and a matter of eternal life. But notice Jesus, as we say about small groups, here even with an opponent, Jesus maintains common ground and redirects with a counter question 
as he was apt to do. Jesus said, what is written in the law? And what is your reading of it? And so the lawyer smartly responded, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. It was a good answer. It was the right answer. But listen to Jesus' response. Jesus said, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. You see, this religious expert and much of God's people, they didn't have a problem professing the commands. They didn't have a problem quoting the love commands. They'd be happy to tell you to love the Lord and to tell you to love your neighbor as yourself. But they had a lot of preconceived boundaries with regards to practicing those commands. They had mastered in the art of exclusion. They had escape clauses written in on every page. They were the experts at excluding themselves from the practice of what God had commanded. We see it in this lawyer because he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? And it was really this question, he just didn't have the guts to say it. What he was really saying is, I want to know who is not my neighbor. I don't mind loving, uh, loving Bob and Sally who live on my block and go to my church, but I'm more interested in who I don't have to love. So who's my neighbor? But he was talking to the wrong man. Surrounded by disciples and a gathered crowd of both supporters and opponents, Jesus seized the opportunity and he shared this story. It was on the road to Jericho from Jerusalem about 17 miles, a road that twisted and turned through hilly, barren terrain, descending 3,500 feet over those 17 miles. It was flanked by that type of terrain. The road was notoriously treacherous and renowned for criminal gangs preying on the travelers. Jesus said a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell as would be expected among these thieves who stripped him of his clothing. They wounded him and abandoned him, leaving him half dead. Now we know nothing about this man, the victim, no motive is given for his trip. No rebuke or judgment is made. There is nothing that would identify the guy laying half dead in the ditch. He was just a certain man who had been robbed and wounded and abandoned and left for dead. Quite simply, this certain man could be anyone anywhere or maybe everyone, everywhere, Jesus was making his point. But as Jesus revealed in John 10, Satan shares the same diabolical intent towards all of humanity as the thieves exercise towards this man. Jesus said, the thief does not come to steal except to steal and to kill and to destroy. That is the role of the, the thief. That is the role of Satan. As Peter would say, he is like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Wherever people are on the road of life, there he is. And he's out to kill, and he's out to steal, and he's out to destroy. And so a certain man was really everyone, everywhere, and could be anybody, anywhere. Robbed, viciously beaten, discarded to die alone, 
this man laid helplessly along the road to Jericho. And maybe because he was just coming off of a tour of duty, it just happened by chance that as he possibly returned home to Jericho, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And then a Levite, when he arrived at the place, he came and looked and passed by on the other side. Their motive for not acting, their motive for refusing to help remains unknown. Were they afraid of being ambushed themselves? Did they think that was, was a trick of the gangs to lure them in that they themselves would be injured? Did they assume that he was dead? We do not know if the victim was unconscious or writhing in pain. Jesus did not bother to tell us. Were they afraid of touching or coming within six feet of a defiled corpse? We do not know. But regardless of their possible motives for remaining as far away from that man as they could be, they were nonetheless obligated to help. You see, Jews were required to quickly bury any neglected corpse, and that included even the high priest or a Nazarite. And for most Jews, there was no law, not even the purity laws that stood in the way of saving a life. So suffice it to say, it is not by accident that neither the priest nor the Levite are given a voice because whatever they had to say, it was inexcusable. They were without excuse. And following the same cadence, they did nothing for the man laying half dead in a ditch. Instead, they came, they saw, and they passed by on the other side. And now to the Jewish audience who were intently listening to every word that Jesus spoke. They were engaged in the story. They were hanging on every word. What happened next shocked their sense of superiority and it shattered their erroneous traditions. Without a doubt, the Jews' relationships with the Samaritans ebbed and flowed throughout their history but it was particularly poor in the first century. The Jews had not forgotten that just prior to 9 AD, the Samaritans had scattered bombs in the holy temple. And so the scale was now tipped more firmly towards them, viewing them as impossible heretics than possible proselytes. They did not have anything to do with the dogs of Samaria. The Samaritans did not exist. But a certain Samaritan was traveling down the road and he journeyed as they did. And he came to where the man was just like they did. And he saw him as they did. But this guy had compassion. Notice that the Samaritan follows the same cadence initially. He came and he saw. But unlike the others, this guy slowed down. The pace of the story slows down. This guy did not just come down the road. This guy did not just come to the place. This guy came near to where the man was. And while the motive of the priest and the Levite was irrelevant due to their lack of action, the motive of the Samaritan acting is revealed. He was moved with compassion. Closing that gap of indifference, the Samaritan not only saw the desperate need of the man, but he was moved with pity and love for that man. This is the turning point of the entire story. This is where it all changes. 
that a Samaritan, a guy who did not exist in their world, a guy who they just as soon would have seen dead. Jesus used that impossible dude to speak to them, that it was him who came near, it was him who saw the need, and it was him who was moved with compassion. Hallelujah. Here, Jesus races through the priest, and he races through the Levite, but he slams on the brake when he starts talking about the Samaritan. He slows it all down. Jesus said that the Samaritan now goes to this guy. He bandages his wounds. He pours in oil and wine, kind of like Neosporin on the wounds probably. And he sets him on his own animal. This guy is not a weakling. And he brings him to an inn and he takes care of him. And the next day, when he must depart, he took out two denarii or two days worth of wages, which would have covered about two weeks worth of care. And he gave them to the innkeeper and said to the innkeeper, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. Motivated by compassion, the Samaritan risked more than was required. He made himself vulnerable to others. Realize, he, he realized also he could not help this guy alone. And so he brought the abused man to a community of care. But even in that community of care, this Samaritan did not abandon the man, but he bore the open-ended commitment that I will pay for every time to see that this man is made whole and that he is restored. The victim's downward spiral of robbery and injury and abandonment is now reversed by an upward spiral of compassion and care and restoration. And it all hinged on the most unlikely of heroes who would come and who would see, but would be moved with compassion and would say, I don't know who you are and I don't know why you're here, but without judgment and without devaluing you, I will stop and I will draw near and I will care for you. <laughs> Leaving a thousand questions unanswered, you have them, I have them. We'd love to have the opportunity to draw Jesus aside and say, that was the cliff notes, but I'd like the unabridged version. Jesus did not, but he turned his attention back to this lawyer and poses yet another counter question. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Don't ask me who is your neighbor. There's no boundaries to that question. Let me ask you, are you a neighbor? Stripped of all his justifications and all of his misguided traditions, the lawyer, I mean, there's only one answer. You've got to be dumb, stupid, spiritually and in every other way to not get the point of the story. This guy is not that smart, but he's smart enough. And he says... He who showed mercy on him. Having confronted those erroneous limitations imposed on the beautiful love commands upon which all of Scripture hinged, Jesus said. Jesus now reiterates what he had already proclaimed to the lawyer when he said, go and do and you will live. Jesus just said, go and do likewise. If you're seeking eternal life with me, if you're professing to be my disciple, love God with all that you are and with all that you do and love your neighbor in word and deed without any self-imposed boundaries. In that, you will find eternal life and in that, you will evidence that you are my 
disciple. You see Jesus surrounded by a treacherous, a divisive, and a chaotic culture. He told the story of the Good Samaritan to both capture our hearts and minds and to compel us to go and do likewise. 2,000 years later, not much has really changed in culture. Satan and the systems of this world seek to bury us under an avalanche of distractions, busy schedules, constant reminders updating us, incessant breaking news alerts, social media and gaming addictions. Satan wants to distract us as we journey down the road of life. Further, Satan and the systems of this world viciously employ a divide and conquer strategy to steal, kill, and destroy political polarization, racial unrest, and class warfare. And tragically, not even the church is immune from this divisive tribalism that is perpetuated by hell itself. And it's not just about you and me stumbling into an ambush of hell, and it's not just about you and me being spiritually destroyed. It is about ensuring that even if we survive, that we don't notice the half-dead bodies that litter the way as we blindly journey towards our eternal home, singing some glad morning, we shall see Jesus in the air. Because Satan is terrified that you and I would see with spiritually anointed eyes those who are near and those who are need. Satan is panicked by the thought that in Christ's stead that you and me would draw near, that we would be moved with compassion and that we would render aid to the helpless with love and mercy. We are hell's worst nightmare. And so he seeks to distract and he seeks to cause us to blindly wander down the road of life. He doesn't want you to notice that everywhere you look and turn that there are people of great worth to the Lord Jesus Christ and they have been abandoned and left to die by the systems of this world. And so it is not merely enough that we hear the story of the Good Samaritan. We must go and do likewise. You see, the New Testament repetitively affirms that genuinely loving God is evidenced by both our unconditional obedience to his word and our unconditional love for others. Jesus said in John 13 and 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In 15 and 10, he said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. He said in verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Like Peter's request for a boundary on forgiving others in Matthew 18, Jesus obliterated any boundary that we would place on loving others. No racial barrier, no social barrier, no political barrier, no economic barrier can be excused. Jesus obliterated every restriction that we would try to justify ourselves to say that I can see and pass by and not be impacted by the guy who's laying in the ditch. Without judgment and without condemnation, we must go and do likewise. Remembering where God rescued us from and the pit that God pulled us out of, we must go and do likewise. Did not Paul starkly remind us, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? 
do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. This is a list of people that it might be awkward to talk to. This is a list of people that it might be easy to ignore. This is a list of people that you and I could say they get what they deserved. You want to live that way? You get what you deserve. And in some respects of Romans 1, I understand that. But Jesus said, and Paul reminded us, and such were some of you. You were on that list. You was in that ditch. You were more foul. You were more filthy. You was discarded. You was abandoned. You was hurt. You was wounded. You were abused. You were addicted. You was an alcoholic. You were bound by fear. You were consumed by anger. You were filled with pride. You were so filled with insecurity. You couldn't look at yourself without torturing yourself. Such were some of you, but you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified by the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. When we remember who we were and when we remember where God has brought us from, remembering that we must go and do like wise. Somebody got their hands dirty helping you. Somebody put their reputation on the line helping you. Somebody was vulnerable to being exploited helping you. The story of the Good Samaritan is always and has always been relevant. But in this season where God is heightening our awareness and affirming our mission to gather the outcast, I'm drawn to this powerful parable all over again. If they are near and if they are in need, they are my neighbor. If they are near and they are in need, they are my neighbor. Go and do likewise. Starting maybe in our own families, go and do likewise. God forbid that I'd be willing to go across the street to minister to a neighbor, but I ignore the person in need in my own home, starting in my own family. If they are near and in need, go and do likewise. Expanding the circle of nearness to include our brothers and sisters who have abandoned their faith They've turned their back on God. They have squandered the blessings of God on their life. But let us not sit with folded arms and stern chins and harsh looks and be mad that the Father would even think about them. But let us go and do likewise. Let us draw near to them. Let us see them with pity and compassion, recognizing that they are a wreck of sin, that they have been deceived by the begotten howling serpent and they are on a path of spiritual suicide but let us step into the ditch and say my brother and my sister I will risk you cussing me I will risk you forsaking me I will risk you being angry at me but I will go and do likewise I will seek to administer care I will seek to introduce you back to a community of care I will go and do likewise to the diverse strangers that surround us every day that we can discount because of their politics, their skin color, the car they drive, the language they speak, the way they comb their hair, the music they listen to, the team they cheer for. Well, all the reasons why we can ignore to all those diverse strangers that are near as we drive and as we work and as we play go and do likewise if they are near and if they are in need, they are our neighbor. No, we're not responsible for them and their choices and their actions, but you better believe we are responsible to them, to love them, to notice them, 
to be moved with compassion for them and to seek and provide care to them. Go and do likewise. And why not start right here, right now? I've been interrupted throughout this day by the Spirit that there are people in this sanctuary maybe watching online and you're desperately in need. You're near and you're in need. Stripped of worth, broken of spirit, wounded in body. Yes, as we leave here, we must go and do likewise tomorrow and Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and every day thereafter. But before we go and do, we have the opportunity to do likewise right here tonight.